Good morning and welcome to the service with a difference. It is the 5th of September 2021 and it is our second week as we look at James's letter to the Jews who are spread throughout the world. Um, those who were probably converted on the day of Pentecost came to faith in Christ, have been learning about Christ and, and James writes to them and saying this is what it looks like when we live out our faith in Christ in the world. Today we are reading from Psalm 103, um, just a, a psalm extolling God's great love and his compassion for his people, his mercy on his people. We're also going to be reading from Matthew chapter 7, um, from verse 21 to verse 27, part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, as he speaks about how not everybody is going to listen to him, um, but those who do listen to him, they will be building their faith on, on a solid, solid foundation. And then we're going to be reading from James, James chapter 2. We're going to read the whole of chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 26. And James is, as he calls them to, to be faithful to God, um, he is reminding them who God is. God is merciful and God is just. And so therefore, we need to be both as well. Um, and he tells us what faith looks like in terms of our relationship with others. And again, I'm going to ask that you put this on pause as you first read through those readings. And as we read through them, we give God thanks for them. And we pray that he will bless them to us as we reflect on them in, in this moment. Last week, we spoke about how James envisions the community of, of the faithful. And, and it is not unlike any of the other writings we find in Scripture, where it speaks of how the community needs to be a place in which people are able to grow, a place in which people respect each other. Um, a place in which people are able to be as God is. But we said in, in James' understanding, it's, it's, a, it's a whole unit that functions together, that, that builds each other, that everybody is doing what everybody needs to do. And we said it's not unlike a beehive or, or, or an ant nest. And we went with the symbolism of, of a beehive. And I'd like to carry on with that beehive symbolism this week. Um, and we know that in a beehive, there, there is neither a monarchy nor a government. You know, the queen has a function and her function is not to rule everyone else because like everyone else, she she just follows her instinct, you know, and, and it's like an ideal world in which nobody should rule over anybody else because we're all following God. And, and when we're able to follow God perfectly and, and we're, we're able to have his rule realized amongst us as a, as a body, then then the body will, will, will operate perfectly Then the system will operate perfectly. And, you know, in a beehive, then the drones take care of the queen, the queen lays the eggs and the workers um, collect and manufacture the honey, they, 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 they clean the hive, they take care of the larva, and, and they all know exactly who will do what, because, well, this is what they do. Um, they've got no issue with wanting to be something else, because everybody is content doing exactly what they are meant to be doing, and it's instinct. Um, you know, we should also become instinctive in in seeking to follow God's rule in, in our world um, and to be content with the gifts that, that God has given us in order to, to glorify him and build each other up, um, to build the body up. But the, but the problem is that we have tasted something else. You know, we have tasted sin. Um, we have tasted something we imagine would be better, either because somebody told us that it would be better or because we believed it would be better because we were following our own mind. And, and so, so we struggle. We struggle to be at peace with all that God has given to us. As we return to that space of fulfilling the royal law, as James calls um, the great commandments, um, love God, love your neighbor, we need to ask ourselves again, what does that mean for us? How can we be faithful to God and be faithful to each other? If all people are, are your neighbors, then, then it means we shouldn't show partiality, says James. We can't disinvite some because that would mean that we are only loving some of our neighbors. And so, so he says to them, don't, don't show favoritism, don't, don't show partiality. And I wonder how often we make judgments based on outward appearances. You know, the wealthy look like they've got it all worked out and, and they're comfortable. And the poor like, look like they don't have anything worked out and, and they're uncomfortable. And so instead of helping the poor, we, we favor the rich because we favor those that we aspire to. 
positively or negatively, it makes no difference. You know, we visit a shack and we wonder how these people can be happy. And we visit somebody who is wealthy and we wonder how they can't be happy. And I, and I believe that one of the worst sins we can commit as people is to create in the heart of any person the belief that one person is better than another person or that one class is better than another class, that one race is better than another race, that one, that one gender is better than another gender. And there has always been a conflict of interest between the socially powerful and the socially powerless. And obviously wealth, wealth plays a big role in determining social power. You know, even the disciples believe that the rich must be blessed by God and the poor are poor because they have been cursed by God. But in reality, the rich are not blessed and the poor are not cursed. The rich have the means to take care of the poor. The, the lives of those who are able to care for themselves are sacred. And the lives of those who, who are not able to take care of themselves are, are no less sacred. Our economy is struggling. And whatever we may have invested in is now worth less as the rain drops. Um, and so the economic net value of everybody in, in the country has dropped. And we see that, by the way, in which we get less for our money. But just because we're getting less for our money does not make us any less as, as a human. You are not less than you are now. You are not any less sacred. If you do believe that you are any less than you are, because your economic net worth is less, then it means you are trying to buy love. You are trying to buy kindness. You are trying to buy worth and value. But you, you shouldn't be any less valuable. And if your sacredness doesn't change, then why would the sacredness of the poorest of the poor be any less than the sacredness of, of the wealthy? What makes one person more expendable than another person? Our sacredness is not determined by our wealth or the economic health of the country. It is determined by virtue of the fact that we are God's children, by virtue of the fact that we are created in the image of a holy and a sacred God. The, the queen and the drone and the worker bees, they, they're all equally respectful and they are equally regarded within the hive because they are all making sure that the system runs perfectly. Their focus is not on advancement or on power, but, but on being a part of something that they were created into. Um, their joy is found in doing their part for the greater whole. No one slacks and no one works twice as hard. And I want to say the divide between those who have and, and those who don't have only exists because we live in an imperfect world. And it's an imperfect world because people are, are corruptible. You know, some work, some don't work. Some use their gifts and their resources and their abilities. Some don't use their gifts and their resources and their abilities. Some are given an opportunity. Some are not given an opportunity. Some are rewarded for their effort fairly. Some are not rewarded for their effort fairly. Some are favored. Some are not favored. And, and the, world is, the world is not ideal because in an ideal world, everyone who worked would would earn exactly what they needed. And if you if you didn't have exactly what you needed, even though you made the effort, those around you would would, would help you. And, and this would be a world in, in which there was no unemployment. This would be a world in which nobody placed any strain on anybody else because everybody simply did their best. And so James' call to, to those who have come to faith in Christ says, remember who Christ is, remember who God is as he has been made known in Christ God is impartial. God shows no favoritism. And so you too, as the faithful of God, need to show no favoritism. You should be impartial as well. And you will only be impartial when you engage with the world. Be faithful to, to God. Be faithful to the others by, by engaging with the world around you. A bee is a bee, and it gives expression to its beeness by being a bee, by doing what a bee does. Um, a bee that is not busy doing what a bee should be busy doing is, is not a bee. Um, a bee is 100% a bee when a bee is 100% doing what a bee does. And so a life of faith is a life of keeping our relationship with God and our relationship with others in balance. 
Um, and I'm not talking about 50-50. I'm talking about 100-100. You know, I'm 100% a child of God, and I am called to glorify God 100%, and I am called to build a community up 100%. It's not what we do. It is it's who we are. And as we learn to love as Christ loves, we discover that we have less regard for the social standing of a person and more regard for the state of that person's soul. You know, if we start to treat people as sacred, maybe they will start to see that sacredness in in themselves. How often do you speak to the homeless person? How often do you do you look at the woman who is cleaning the floors at the shop? How often do you thank her for her work? How often do you apologize to her for we're having to walk over a just clean floor. How often do you confront the manager of the shop that you are at for the way in which they are treating their employees? You know, these are people who are always there. And so we build relationship with them because we want to. We build relationship with them because we believe that they are sacred. And this ideal community that James envisages is a world in which each person pays attention to, to the people around them. Each person accepts responsibility for their own life and each person accepts responsibility for the way that their lives affect the lives of those around them. And so an ideal world is one in which we choose to be in relationship with each other and in that relationship we we help each other into achieving our full potential and we are free to hold each other accountable. You know, it's a world where, where everyone is equally sacred and that's what love is. But you will also know that showing mercy or, or loving people perfectly takes, takes discernment. Because how do I love you properly? Do I, do I do for you what you can do for yourself? Or do I choose not to do for you what you can do for yourself? That's what makes real relationship difficult. That's what makes true faith difficult. Discerning what is the best way to, to love someone. Accepting that there are no standard answers, there are no general answers that will cover every situation because every person in every situation is different. And so we have to ask if our acts of mercy are building others up, or we have to even ask if the way in which others are showing us mercy is building us up. You know, do we, do we make the other person a better person by giving to them, or do we enable them to become beggars? Because we can make a beggar out of, out of anyone. Do we... Do we give them dignity by the way in which we help, by the way in which we give? Or do we actually strip them of dignity by creating a sense of dependence, by creating an attitude of entitlement? James says it so beautifully. He says, faith that is not accompanied by action is dead. But actions that are not led by faith also lead to death. The law brings freedom because it gives us guidelines and, and we need boundaries in, in order to live fully. And, and the perfect law, obviously, is, is love. And so when we are dealing with others, we need to ask what the most loving thing to do would be. And the most loving thing always begins with respect. It doesn't, it doesn't begin with guilt. It doesn't begin with fear. It begins, it begins with respect. And the most loving thing is that while I am being a bee, as a part of a beehive, I am helping others to be a bee within this beehive. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord God, that, that you have shown us that our love is to be for all people and that however they are classified in this world, your love has classified each one as sacred. Lord Jesus, you, you have not waited that we become perfect before you have loved us. It is your love for us that makes us better. It is your love for us that draws us on to perfection. And so we pray in this moment, Lord, for the help we need so that we can love as you love. And that by the way in which we love others, we, we will help you draw them on to perfection, even as we ourselves are drawn on to perfection. We pray this in your precious, precious name. Amen.